16 and 17. Romans chapter 1, I would like to do a little review um, of where, where we are in Romans, just a little overview, let us get, excuse me, I'm having a little problem. Right. Hope everyone found their place, and we're in our sermon series in the book of Romans, um, being established in the gospel. The one thing we need to be as Christians is established in the gospel. That's the first thing you want to teach new believers, and get them established in God's word, and especially in the gospel, how we are saved what it takes to become a Christian, uh, you know, the big church words, salvation, justification, sanctification, they all mean something, glorification. We're going to teach you about those as we go through the book of Romans. I once heard someone make a comment that we shouldn't use church words, you're too churchy. I'm like, hey, they're Bible words. So... If they're Bible words, we're going to go with the Bible word, and we'll just add definition and teach people what the Bible words means. I think that's the best way to do it, and so we're going to, we're going to do that as we move through the book of Romans. And so here we are, starting, I'm going to start with verse 1 and read through this just to get it fresh in our mind once again. Paul is servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God which he promised beforehand through his prophets in his holy scriptures concerning his son. He was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have here is Paul with his introduction of the letter. No one saw that. Shh. It came off. All right. And so what we have here is Paul's introduction to the letter. He establishes the fact that he is an apostle. He was taught by Christ. He has apostolic authority. We saw that Peter recognized his teaching as the word of God, holding it in the same stance as the Old Testament scriptures. We have that he is an apostle of Christ and talks about the power of Christ and how Christ came back to life and he's including Jesus and in all of this in, just in the introduction I think that's the mark of any true Christian in any great church is that you're always talking about Jesus and his power and his resurrection it's not about the pastor or or you it's really we're pointing other to Christ always and that's what Paul's doing here we should follow in his footsteps then he goes on to talk about more introduction here in verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you, always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at least, excuse me, at last succeed in coming to you. 
For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented in order that I may reap some harvest among you, as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. And again, a little summation as you can read that is Paul's traveling around the Roman Empire. He's starting churches. He has this desire to go to Rome, to the capital, and to preach Christ there and to reach Jews and Gentiles in Rome. But he has this other work he must accomplish first before he can go. But he heard of their, their great name throughout the Roman Empire. And that's my prayer is that we would have a great name in our community, that we're a loving church, that we are a biblical church, that we love God and other people. That's a good name. To, it's good to have a great name throughout the community that you live in and not have a negative name or a negative example attached to your church. No one wants that, do you? And neither do I. This be a loving, a, a church established in the gospel. Uh, verse 18, excuse me, verse 16. And here's where we're going to be camping out today and finish up from our last sermon two weeks ago. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. That is written, the righteous shall live by faith. The righteous shall live um, by faith. And so, by way of review, I would like to just each week establish our vision. A great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission will grow a great church. If we are committed to loving God with all our heart, mind, and strength and loving others as ourselves and preaching the gospel, we'll continue to be a great church. The vision of our church is what? To strengthen individuals and families through truth and community. It's in our name, Cibolo Creek Bible Church. We are to be established in the truth of God's word. And then we that plays out in our community. We do this through large group celebration on Sunday mornings, coming together, all of our groups and our homes coming together to celebrate what God's doing in our life through the week. So we do that on Sunday mornings. And then the multiplication and ministry of life groups. Before uh, we attempted to merge with the waters, um, and hey, it didn't work out. So... We're going on. But what I told our leaders and what we told our pastors is, no matter what happens, we're going to keep doing what we're doing. We're going to keep making disciples. Our goal for 2016 was to start new, two new churches, life groups, in neighborhoods in this area. That hasn't changed. It's still our goal. It's still our vision to reach our community through the multiplication and ministry of life groups in the home. We're still going to make disciples. We're still going to move forward with that. So, um, i next forget that. So, Romans overview. Who, are the, who wrote Romans? It was the Apostle Paul. He was a Jewish Pharisee who was persecuting the church, right? And he had his salvation experience. And and was converted and born again. He was taught by Christ by revelation. And he was called to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Who were the recipients? It was the church in Rome. Now the church in Rome, they didn't have even a big building like this. They met in homes. They met in small gatherings. During times of persecution, the church in Rome even met in the catacombs for some as I read through Christian history, they, they meet in the catacombs for church services. Hey, you go where they're not going to beat you or kill you for Christ, right? That's worshiping in a graveyard? That's great. We're going to bring some dead people to life. That's great. So uh, you got to love this church in Rome. They 
they were later to come under much persecution, but they, were, they withstood the persecution. Why? Because they were established in the gospel. They were established in God's word. And that's what we need to be. I don't know, I just feel like persecution's coming. Do you all feel that? You can see it, the, the atmosphere in our country changing. The only way you're going to stand through persecution is what? To know in whom you believe, to know what you believe and why you believe it. To be established in the gospel. And then as we reach new people in, with the gospel, to establish these young converts in the gospel. So this is very important. Very important to be established in the gospel and to stand. To be stand in times of persecution and trouble. Uh, that's coming. I'll, the other side of the quarter of that is, hey, when things are going great, you need to be established in the gospel then too. No persecution. Maybe that's harder because you don't have anything coming down on you. Uh, let the good times roll, man. Money's coming in. Nice house, nice car. Everybody's doing great. Hey, but you tend to forget God in that, don't you? At least I have at times in my life. So we be established in the gospel and the good times and the bad. So he writes this letter to, the, to Christians in Rome who are both Jews and Gentiles. Hey, that's a big thing to overcome there. The Jews call Gentiles dogs, <laughs> you know? And the, the, the Romans look down upon the Jews. And all the people in Rome look down upon Christ. You, your king was crucified on a cross? Man, that's, a, that's for filth. Only filth and slaves are crucified on a cross. So they have all of these boundaries to overcome. And Paul writes this letter to, to bring oneness in Christ to the body in Rome and to strengthen them in the gospel. Anyway, so... Uh, why did he write the letter? To establish strength in the believers. Romans 1, 18 through 32. Because of moral decay. Excuse me. <coughs> the answer to uh, moral decay is the gospel. And we just read about that. Uh, the need to be established because of false teachers as well. Romans 16, 17 through 18. So, again, it doesn't take long for Satan to come in and try to bring division to a church. And he does it a lot of times through false teaching, through disunity, through gossip, right? We need to be aware of those things and to be established in the gospel, to be established in God's word. So when divisions come, when disunity comes, or false teaching comes, what? You're ready for it. And you're ready to act and you can see it when it, when it pops up. So we're talking about the gospel now. We're going to see verse 16 and 17, established in salvation, the gospel saves. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God unto salvation. What is salvation? What is that word? That's a church word. It means to be de to delivered, to be delivered from sin and the power of sin. It's an encompassing word. It's an umbrella term that, that everything falls under salvation. It's like I said, it's justification, it's sanctification, it's glorification. That's all salvation. We need to be delivered from sin. Salvation, deliverance from the guilt of sin. Salvation from the power of sin. And the reason I'm not going into more Depth, as I've already preached this, I'm just doing it as a way of reminder to keep us back on track. Salvation from the pollution of sin and salvation from the wrath of God. That's the whole point of salvation. And I said that we need to preach the whole gospel, that we are sinners, we're under the wrath of God, and without the mercy and grace of God, we deserve hell. And when you're preaching Christ to your friends, Satan's going to come to you and say, hey, you see your friends a little uncomfortable right here. You better pull back. No, don't do that. You just keep reading the word. You keep sharing the gospel with them. Because it is the power of God and the salvation 
And I don't want this to sound, I'm not trying to sound harsh or to be hurtful to anyone, but the word of God must crush the person's pride. And the law does that. I would encourage you, as you learn to share your faith and you learn to be prepared in the gospel, is to go on YouTube and watch The Way of the Master. Just watch the videos with Kirk Cameron and Ray Comfort. Um, In those videos, they'll show you how to use the law to bring about repentance. They're not, they don't do it. You use the word of God to bring about repentance of sin. And just take them through the Ten Commandments. So watch that on YouTube. Way of the Master, Kirk Cameron, Ray Comfort. And so you come in with the law, and you come in with the word of God, and it breaks people down. It, it It shows them their need of Christ and that I've sinned against God and then they're ready to receive the grace of God. They're ready to receive the good news of God. And so deliverance from the power of sin and all those things. Then we get down to the gospel saves and the gospel restores. Salvation completely restores the sinner to God. Do you understand this? A lot of times we say that, oh, salvation is just forgiveness of sins. Hey, and we stop there. Man, you're missing out. If you think salvation just ends with forgiveness, you're crazy. You've missed it. Salvation restores humanity, the Christian, God's son, to the pre-sinful state of Adam and Eve in the garden. It restores man to this state where you can commune with God in this one-on-one relationship. That's salvation. Look at it in that depth. Not only does it forgive you of your sins, which is great. We all need that, right? We all need to be forgiven. But it restores us and gives us that ability to commune with God and like a father and a child. That's salvation. That's what God has for you. That's what God has for our community. And anything less than that, you're missing out on. You're, you don't... You're not walking in the fullness of everything that Christ has won for you. Walk in that. Walk in the completeness of salvation. I I said it this way. Uh, Salvation is a full tense. Okay? It's a past tense. I have been saved. You can say when we're singing the song, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, and you're worshiping God And you're praising God, what? Because I have been saved. That moment when you trusted Christ, it's joyful. Yes, I've been forgiven. I've been set free. I've been restored to this relationship with God. Yeah, right? So I have been saved in the past. But now I'm being saved in the presence. Right now. Christ, I'm covered by his blood. All my sin, again, Covered on Christ on the cross. All my sins, past, present, and future, taken care of, man. So right now, I am being saved. Right now. Right now. And then, look to the future. I will be saved. Or you can say it uh, in these theological terms. I have been saved. Justification. I am being saved right now. Sanctification. It means I'm growing in my relationship with Christ. I'm growing in holiness. I'm Uh, God is, by his Holy Spirit and the Word, is transforming me to be like Christ right now. Okay? Then, the good part. I know, get your hands up, people. Get your hands. Give me some whoop whoops. I shall be saved. It is the final celebration. I'm going to be with Christ. I am going to be like Christ. It's awesome. Justification, I have been saved. Sanctification, I'm growing in Christ. Glorification, I will be like Christ. I will be with Christ in heaven. That's what gets you through. Established in those facts. Established in the righteousness of Christ. And the depth of all that that means is salvation. 
That's what God has for us. And the whole rest of the book of Romans, he's going to teach us about these things in depth. He's going to tell us what. He's going to tell us why. He's going to tell us how it happens. All this awesome stuff is the gospel saves and the gospel restores. And then the gospel received. Here's what, um, I think there's a, go to the next one. Here's a quote by Martin Luther. Here's this little commentary on verse 17. I'm going to read this verse to you again before. Um, verse 17. For it is the righteousness of God, for in it the gospel that he's not ashamed of, because it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, Jews and first Jews and Greeks. For in it, that gospel, the righteousness, righteousness means, I just told you, a right relationship with God that's pre-fall, where you, you're like Adam and Eve in the garden, you're communion with God in, in depth and beauty in relationship. Restoring to that Awesome relationship. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. That is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Now listen to what Martin Luther said about this verse 17. Night and day I pondered until I saw the connection between the justice of God and the statement that the just shall live by faith. Then I grasp that the justice of God is that the righteousness by which through grace and sheer mercy God justifies us through faith. Immediately I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through open doors into paradise. The whole of Scripture took on a new meaning, and whereas before the justice of God had filled me with hate, now it became in me inexpressibly sweet and greater love. The passage of Paul became to me a gate to heaven. I read this, and it makes me come alive. I read this, I remember the moment I was saved. I was born again, where the Spirit came to live inside of me. I was reborn, not by anything I did, but just by receiving, by faith, Christ's work of dying on the cross and coming back and his shed blood for the forgiveness of my sins. That's it. By faith, at that moment you believe, you're changed and brought into this great relationship. And this is what I would have you to share with your friends and your family. Nothing else. You don't have to do a canned formula. You just bring them to the Word of God. Have them read it for themselves. I've done that. And the older I've gotten, the more I'm into this. And when I was younger, I read the four spiritual laws, had this kind of outline where we would go in and share the gospel. Nothing wrong with that. But I, I found it very powerful to just sit down with someone open the Bible and have them read it for themselves and ask them questions. It's very powerful. And just to share the gospel, the good news with them. And so, all of these blessings, all of these riches we have in Christ, the gateway, the conduit of you receiving that in your life, it's not of works, it's of faith. You understand that? Okay. Now let's go on. The gospel received by faith. But check this out. Romans 1.18. It's received by those who know they are sinners and who are under God's wrath. Romans 1.18. Let's read that. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, and that's mankind, men and women, everyone, 
who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Okay? When you're sharing the gospel, and if you look back to your salvation experience, use the right words. I doubt anyone's conversion who does not have a sense of brokenness. To, any, to anyone who does not have this, when you think back to your salvation, if there's not this uh, desperation to be delivered from sin, if there's no hatred of yourself and your sin, I would doubt your salvation. You might have experienced something. You may have had an emotional high. But if you don't come to this place of hating sin and hating yourself and crying out to God for his deliverance and for his grace, I would, I would test that by the word of God. I would go and look at myself very clearly. And like Martin Luther, I would study these scriptures to see if you were truly born again. Because you can't read the first three chapters of Romans without very clearly seeing the depth of humanity, their depravity, my depravity. What does Isaiah tell us? Um, that our heart is, what, deceitfully wicked? Who can know it? Right? Our heart's deceitfully wicked. My heart was deceitfully wicked. I mean, all you have to do is get on some social media, right? And you're going to see a whole, depends on if your friend or what camp they're in, but mostly you're, all your friends put this stuff on Facebook and if you're conservative and Christian. and It's like just highlighting all the stuff that's going on. How about the Planned Parenthood videos? I haven't watched any of those because I couldn't handle it. It would break my heart, really. We've come to a place in our country where not only are we killing babies and murdering them, now we're going to sell their parts. And there's, a, there's one video where, again, I haven't watched it. I'm just going from what I read in the news, where a baby was still kind of alive and kicking, and they're trying to figure out how they're going to harvest this baby's organs and then to, to to yes and it's easy to say man this this world's messed up i'd be messed up without the grace of god my depravity is before christ was just as worse or, or even could be uh, i don't know if you could be worse but equal to that in some way. Am I, I'm trying to just point out to you the depth of the human heart and the depth of the sin and the depth of the perversion there. And that with the gospel, Christ died for the abortionist just like he died for me. That's the power of the gospel. That's the gospel message. And I would pray that those abortionists the, running that court, clinic would be saved and they would be changed and, and God would just take that off the rolls, you know? Take, just eliminate it from our, our country. It's evil. So when you're sharing the gospel and you're thinking back to your own conversion, I need you to think about how you became a Christian for the next 10 minutes, okay? When you came to Christ, was there repentance? Was there this, I desire, 
I know I'm a sinner. I know without a doubt that I'm going to deserve hell. I, I deserve a punishment for my sins. I'm, I'm a sinner. I'm evil. And you're just running to God in desperation. Is that part of it? Or was it this? You know, you're at a youth rally. You, you're chewing on some gun. You and your boys go up front. And the guy says, hey, would you like to say the sinner's prayer? Sure, sure, we'll say the sinner's prayer. Turn his gun. Dear Jesus, oh, uh, dear Jesus. Oh, dear Lord, uh, I've sinned against you. I've sinned against you. And um, uh, uh, please forgive me and come into my heart. Amen. There's no repentance. There's no brokenness of sin. There's no, uh, <laughs> there's no commitment in that. I know a guy who had such an experience as a teenager, but later in life, come to find out that he was trusting in that prayer. He wasn't trusting in Jesus Christ. No brokenness. No repentance of sin. No repentance of believing that you can save yourself, but that you would have to trust in Jesus Christ alone. So the gospel received by faith by those who know they are sinners, who are under the wrath of God. By faith. Every aspect of the salvation that we've talked about, everything, all the blessings, all the riches, comes to you through faith. Now, what is faith? That's the next question I'd want to look at. If I were, I'm studying this. I'm thinking about my conversion. I'm thinking about how I share the gospel with others. What is faith? When you tell someone, hey man, you want to get saved? You believe the gospel. You believe in Jesus. He died for you. He came back to life. Boom. What does that mean? What does that mean? Do you know? I'll tell you in a second. But what does that mean? Is that just, oh, okay. I believe some facts about Jesus. I read in my world history class where Jesus was a historical figure 2,000 years ago. And he was, died on the cross. And uh, so people tell me that he died and he came back to life. So is just believing those facts about Jesus, is that enough? Is that the biblical faith? No, it's not. It's mere, that's just mere intellectual assent to some facts. It doesn't save you. It's part of it, right? The salvation process, faith has to do with your mind, has to do with your heart, your emotions, and your will. Listen to a couple of these verses, uh, verses, excuse me, these quotes that I have. I found these in some dictionaries, Bible dictionaries. First, faith is human belief in and a reliance upon the divine. Okay, that's a little straightforward. Faith is human belief, trust, a belief in and reliance upon the divine. Okay, all right, let's go to the next one. What does this one say? Faith, a constant outlook of trust towards God, whereby human beings abandon all reliance on their own efforts and put their full confidence in Christ, his word, and his promises. Hey, that's getting a little bit closer to what faith is in the salvation experience. The Assembly's Shorter Catechism says this, Faith in Jesus Christ is a saving grace whereby we receive <coughs> and rest upon Christ alone for salvation. And he is offered to us, uh, that he is offered to us in the gospel. Okay, do you see the difference there from just having a mental ascent of facts, but that faith is complete trust in throwing yourself upon Christ in all of your being, mind, heart, will. At your conversion experience, if there was no conviction of the Holy Spirit, if there's no brokenness, if there wasn't a full throwing of yourself upon Christ and his mercy and looking to him, I would doubt my experience. And if you search your experience and you look back 
And you're like, yeah, that, I can test my experience by the word of God. See, that's the whole key. So we're testing our conversion experience against the word of God. We don't, you know, if your experience doesn't line up with the word of God, then I would, I would, I would doubt that experience is being from God. So make sure when you're sharing the gospel, when you're preaching the gospel to others, and you're thinking about your own conversion experience, that you would remember that the gospel saves, it delivers us from the power of sin, from the guilt of sin, the pollution of sin, and from God's wrath. And then that the gospel restores us, not only forgives us, but restores us to a a, a pre-fall relationship with the Father in communion and in intimacy with Him. And that the gospel then, salvation experience, you must be received by faith by those who know they are sinners and under God's wrath. And faith means a full reliance upon desperation, just throwing yourself on the, the mercy seat of God, just believing and trusting in that alone for your salvation. That is the gospel. That is how one is saved and that's how one is changed. That is faith. So, here's a picture of the salvation process, uh, process and being in the storm. Next one. So, I kind of brought this up a few weeks ago, but I just want to go back to it quickly. Lost in the storm. This is a picture, a metaphor of where you were and where people are today in our community. They're lost in sin. There are ships about to go down. They're about to be destroyed and die and go to hell, man. That's the truth of the situation. That's it. That's where everyone stands. This is the picture. So we're lost in the storm. But God has given us the guiding light. He has given us the answer to sin and death and Satan, and all the evil in the world. He's given it to us in his word. You are a lighthouse. You understand that? What happens if the lighthouse keeper doesn't shine the light? That boat, if it doesn't die here in the waves, if, it's try, if it makes it back to the shoreline, and the the light keeper doesn't have the light on, then the boat's going to crash upon the rocks. Let your light shine, church. We have the gospel. We're not ashamed of it. It's the power of God and the salvation. Don't let Satan put your light out. I can ask some more questions. Is your light shining? If it is, great, awesome. If it's not, why? And then, so we're shining the light, we're preaching the gospel, the full gospel, as we have it. And then once, what, people believe and receive by faith the gospel, then we are safe in the harbor. And that's the last picture there. Safe in the harbor. This is where God wants you. Safe in the harbor. This is where God wants your family of friends. Safe in the harbor. But the only way to get there is through the light of the gospel. Your friends and family, I don't get to the safety of the harbor without Christ. And they won't get there without me sharing the gospel with them. This is the end. This is where we are going to be. This is where Christ wants us all safe in the harbor. So let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear God, I am completely overwhelmed. My heart is soft and open 
to you, my heart is full of joy and passion for the gospel. Because you took me from, the, from this place of vileness, from this place of evil, from this place of sin. And undeservingly, you came and you called me and you convicted me. And I heard the word of God preached. I heard the gospel preached. And the gospel was irresistible to me. It was like I had to drink from that living water. I didn't deserve it. None of us do. And Father, I pray for our church. I pray for individuals in here right now that if they do not know you, that you would fall down upon them and that you would draw them and convict them and and just have them come to a place where desperation, where they would trust fully in you. And I pray for other Christians. Some have been Christians a short time. Some have been who are older and been Christians for years. Maybe their light's not shining as, as fully as it once was. So God, I pray that you would come and stir them up. Stir them up by your spirit and stir them up by your word. Give them a hunger and thirst for a righteousness and a, and a, a hunger and a desire to be a part of the mission and a hunger and a desire to lead their family, and a hunger and a desire to walk in the holiness, and a hunger and a desire, Lord, to be used by you to minister to their families and to this church and in the community. That's our prayer. That's our desire, Lord. It's for the gospel and the revival fires to, to be stirred up amongst us. That's our desire. That's our prayer, Lord. We're desperate for you. Our country is desperate for you, Lord. We need, we need you, God. Our country has turned their back on you. Uh, churches have turned their back on you, God. Please help us. Please help us, Lord. We can't do it ourselves. We're in a desperate way. Raise up godly men and women to stand, Lord, and to, that you can use and to bring about revival in this place, in our church, in our lives, in our country. Uh, Father, with all of our hearts, we ask for opportunities this week to minister to one another and to minister to people in our community. When opportunities make themselves available, will you show us where you're working in people's lives, where you're showing us what you're doing? Holy Spirit, prompt us to get involved and to obey you and to minister and to preach Christ to people and to serve them and to love them where they are by grace and by your mercy. We love you, Jesus. We love you. It's in your name we pray, amen. Uh, So, church, the holy remnant, the holy remnant of CCBC is here this morning. And, hey, love you guys.